Okay, good evening, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us tonight for this edition of our permanent exhibition highlight series. Before we get started, just a couple of logistical notes. We will have time at the end of the program for you to ask questions of our two speakers tonight. If you wanna go ahead and locate your Q&A button, it's either located at the bottom of your screen if you're on a computer, it might be at the top if you are on a tablet or phone. Um, so you can go ahead and type a question in there at any point and we will address those at the end of the program. Uh, so I would like to go ahead and start by introducing Mary Pat Higgins, President and CEO of the museum for her introduction. Mary Pat. Thank you so much, Annie. Good, good evening, everyone. As Annie said, I'm Mary Pat Higgins, President and CEO of the Dallas Holocaust and Human Rights Museum. And I'd like to welcome you to tonight's program, Guilty Until Proven Innocent, a conversation with Richard Miles. I'd like to start by thanking our sponsor for tonight's program, IMA Financial Group. We sincerely appreciate your ongoing support of the museum. I'd also like to thank our community partners for this evening, Avance North Texas, Denton Black Film Festival, Educational First Steps, George W. Bush Presidential Center, Legacy Senior Communities, SMU Human Rights Program, Southwest Jewish Congress, and Vickery Meadows Youth Development Foundation. I'd also like to give a special welcome to our museum members joining us this evening. Thank you so much for your continued continued support of the museum during these uncertain times. It means the world to us. And finally, a big thank you to our board members who have been so supportive of our team. I know several of you are tuning in tonight. Thanks for being here. We are pleased to present tonight's conversation as part of our permanent exhibition highlight series. This series provides an in-depth look at different parts of our permanent exhibition from tonight's program on criminal justice to next month's presentation on disability rights, both of which are strands featured in our Pivot to America wing. We hope you will keep an eye out for these programs and join us on this journey. Before I introduce tonight's speakers, I'd like to mention our new series, which will begin a week from tonight, Crucial Conversations, Race and Racism in Our Community. Through this series, we hope to foster an increased understanding of racism in both the historical and contemporary context and an awareness of concrete steps that can be taken to disrupt systemic racism. Please visit our website, dhhrm.org to learn more and sign up. We hope to see you there next week. Tonight, we are honored to have two esteemed speakers joining us. Richard Miles is the founder, president, and CEO of Miles of Freedom, an organization dedicated to providing holistic support for individuals, families, and communities impacted by incarceration. At the age of 19, Richard was arrested for a murder he did not commit, and he was convicted at the age of 20. He spent 15 years in prison fighting for exoneration. Richard is going to share his story with you this evening, so I won't give too much away. Just know that he is truly an incredible individual. We are also honored to welcome Gary Udishin, trial attorney, criminal appellate specialist, and past president of Innocence Project of Texas. He was one of the first lawyers in Texas to be board certified in criminal appellate law and has represented clients in federal and state appellate courts, including the United States Supreme Court. Gary has over 30 years of experience trying cases in federal and state courts. We are first going to hear from Richard, then Gary will join him for a conversation with our own Dr. Sarah Abosh Jacobson, the museum's chief education programs and exhibitions officer. We will also have time at the end of the program for questions. As Annie mentioned, please use the Q&A button located at the bottom screen to type out and submit your question. Now, please help me welcome Richard. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Ms. Pat, that was a beautiful introduction and I am extremely honored and grateful to be able to share the journey of Miles of Freedom on this evening. 
I have to also thank the Dallas Holocaust Museum and each of its community partners that has put on this series, The Fight for Civil Rights in the South. To Annie, Sarah, and Spencer, thank you for coordinating. Gary Udishan, thank you for taking up this topic, guilty until proven innocent with me. Just for a moment, I want us to grasp the relevancy and the gravity of where we are right now. Here we are collectively joined together via Zoom due to the COVID impacts. Under the current political and social climate, the theme for this evening is the fight for civil rights. One could only wish that this was a theme or a lesson of old times, but this is actually the reality of our right now. The fight is still going on. And finally, our topic, guilty and proven innocent. While it is a paradox, this is also the reality of a large population of Americans. And historically, this has been the experience of Black America. My name is Richard Miles, and I am the founder, president, and CEO of Miles of Freedom. At the age of 19, I was given 60 years in the Texas Department of Corrections for a murder and attempted murder that I had no knowledge of. That day in August of 1995, I would have thought that I was the only person ever convicted of a crime that I did not commit. I would have even thought that I was the first person that was ever convicted of a crime. I'm going to read to you an article from the Texas State Library and Archives Commission. For the first 15 years of his existence, only white and Hispanic law workers, breakers, were incarcerated in the Texas state prisons. African Americans were enslaved and seldom became, became involved in the criminal justice system. If a black person committed a serious crime, such as murder, arson, or insurrection, he was hanged. For a minor offense, it was his or her owner who was expected to settle with the victim to punish the slave. The first African Americans to be incarcerated in Huntsville, Texas in late 1863 had not been convicted of any crime. Instead, they were laborers brought to the prison to help operate the clothing, clothing mill. These men came from several walks of life. Some were slaves who had been leased by their owners, others runaway slaves who had been recaptured, and the rest were captured Union prisoners of war. My reality, I was not the first person wrongfully arrested. I was not the first black man that had ever been wrongfully incarcerated and freedom taken. I was raised in Oak Cliff in a very spiritually guided household. I oftentimes comically say that my dad took me to church 40 days out of the week. Every time I turned around, he would find a church service and we were in it. My two younger brothers and my older sister, we grew up with the three pillars in our family, which was education, faith, and family. I attended Skyline High School and my senior year, I had my eyes set for TSTC in Waco to continually take up plastics engineering, which was the vocation that I was taking at Skyline in 1992 and 93. But nothing could have prepared me for May 15th, 1994. Imagine if you will, at the age of 19, what were you doing? What was life like? What was your experiences, your dreams, your aspirations? I had been with my friends all day in Oak Cliff. I actually stayed in North Dallas and one of my friends drove me very early from North Dallas to Oak Cliff to visit some friends in Robin Oak's apartments. It had got a bit late, about 12.30, and I went to one of my friends, Ernest, that stayed in the back of Robin Oak's and I asked him to drive me from Oak Cliff to North Dallas where I stayed. Ernest, ironically, was already going over his girlfriend's house, Carla, that stayed on University and Roper, and I stayed on Crest Haven and Bluffview, which is literally 
right around the corner. I offered Ernest five dollars. He accepted, and we left from Oak Cliff to head to North Dallas. We got to North Dallas, and we ended up getting to his girlfriend's house first, and on University of Roper, and I paid him the five dollars, and I said I will walk the rest of the way home because it was literally up the street. This would be the longest walk of my life. I remember it like it was yesterday. I got out of the car and I'm walking up University. It's probably about one o'clock in the morning and the Love Fear Airport lights were still lit. And as I made a right down the street, I'm walking in front of the Sewell Cadillac shops and looking at the vehicles that line the street. Bluff View is a street that comes or intersects with Lemon Avenue. And so I make a right on Bluff View and I had to go to the payphone that was at the Red Coleman that sat on the corner of Crest Haven and Lover's Lane. I reached, the red, I reached the red Coleman because I had to call my friends and tell them to unlock the door and to cut out the alarm. I did not have the key. I got in touch with him, and hung up the phone, and I crossed the street, not really paying attention to the police car that was sitting on the corner of Crest Haven and Lover's Lane. The next thing I heard was a helicopter, and soon after, the helicopter lights illuminated the area that I was in, and seconds later, police cars from everywhere surrounding me, and all I heard was screams of, get on the ground, get on the ground. I complied to the calls. I was 19 years old. As I was handcuffed, I remember thinking, what was going on. And I'm exclaiming to the police officers, my friend is right around the corner. He just dropped me off. I'm, I've been walking home. You can give him a call. And the police officer said, when you get downtown, if everything that you're saying is true and correct, tell the detective and everything will be all right. That will be the last day that I would see Dallas for 15 years. The placing of the handcuffs on my hands not only sees my physical mobility, but for a moment, it also restricted my dreams, my identity, my aspirations. And I oftentimes say it was at that moment that Richard Ray Miles Jr. died. How does this happen in a place that is defined as the land of the free and the home of the brave where the narrative is all men are created equal? How is it that an innocent person can be ushered through our criminal legal process system and be found guilty when they're actually innocent? I believe as much as we have aspired as a nation to create a criminal justice system, our nation has settled merely for a legal process to incarcerate without the full burden of proof and innocence that is afforded each individual. My fight and my family's fight for civil rights in the South had begun. And little did I know that a fight it would be. If just for a few more moments, I would like to share with you some of the four stages that my family and myself experienced during these years. And I pray that these four stages enlighten you as you move through your life, encountering different situations that may be too overwhelming for you to understand. The first thing that we had to do was we had to awaken, or we had to wake up to the fact that our legal system hasn't always placed justice for all at its helm. Justice has not always been the director of our legal system. Sometimes we have found that our legal system is motivated by racism, fear, prejudice, and even money. And this was a hard thing to digest because my dad was a disabled veteran and he believed in the city and the state and the nation and the flag. And when his son was innocently arrested and wrongfully convicted, it shattered his ideas of what America was. 17 months in the county jail before my six day jury trial. 10 witnesses, nine of the witnesses said I did not do the shooting. The description of the, suit, the, description 
of the shooter was 6264 real dark complexion. I was 5'7, five, 5'8, five, light skinned. I did not even fit the physical description of the shooter. Fingerprints wasn't mine that was found at the scene of the crime. There was no gun ever found on me. The victim that survived testified that I did not look like the shooter. The young lady that was standing next to him testified that I did not look like the shooter. All of my alibis, everybody that I, that I was with that day came and testified during this six day jury trial. And after eight hours of deliberation, the jurors came back with a verdict of guilty, of murder, 40 years. Guilty of attempted murder, 20 years. I was received by the system at the age of 20. I mentally woke up in January of 1997 when the courts found me guilty. Honestly, I do not remember anything after that. Because to me, the system that I felt should have protected me had did more harm to me than I could ever imagine. And so I think I fell into a state of comatose where I was actually not even understanding where I was at. I woke up mentally on Cofield in 1997, one of the largest prisons in Texas housing over 5,000 men. I could no longer stay asleep to the reality that I was an innocent man in prison because that wasn't changing. I had two choices, to either fight for my freedom or die as an innocent man incarcerated. It's hard to accept life's fastballs when someone has thrown them at you. And my family was even a part of the play as well. Because when a person is an incarcerated, when a person is incarcerated, not only is the person incarcerated, but the family dynamics is also fractured. And my parents knew that I was innocent and they walked this journey with me. This awakening pushed us to look for answers. The awakening that our criminal legal system wasn't all that just. And it was things that we just had to do. And one of those things was acknowledgement. And so the first A that I wanna give to you is to accept. Sometimes we have to accept the things that we cannot change. But in accepting the things that we cannot change, there is a point that we have to acknowledge the areas in which we can change. I had to acknowledge my position. And honestly, it was not just a physical position of incarceration that I had to acknowledge. I had to acknowledge internally that I was an innocent man that was placed in the system. And acknowledging my position, I also was enlightened on my capacity or my limits, as well as the authority that I had still within myself. Even though my freedom had been stripped away, stripped away I had to acknowledge even in oppression that I had authority that I had capacity to grow. I met a guy named Benjamin Spencer very early on in my prison sentence on Cofield in 1997. Benjamin Spencer is an innocent man and still incarcerated over 30 years. Benjamin Spencer heard of my wrongful incarceration and he pulled me to the side and he said, Richard, if you're truly innocent, I want you to write Centurion, which is a non-DNA innocence organization in Princeton, New Jersey. And they're one of the few organizations that does non-DNA cases and they're working on my case and I'm expected to be getting out anytime soon. That night in 1997, I sat and I wrote a letter to Centurion and I would receive a letter back stating that due to the overwhelming responses of claims of actual innocence, it takes us a minimum of 10 years before we're able to do somebody's case. 10 years seemed like a long time, but I had just been given 60. So what did I have to lose? My parents on the outside also began to fight. They met a young lady by the name of Ms. Joyce Ann Brown. 
Ms. Josanne Brown is one of the first African-American females or Black Americans in Texas that was wrongfully incarcerated and proven innocent. Ms. Josanne Brown started an organization called MASS. My mom searched for Ms. Brown and began to volunteer at MASS and began to tell the story of her son. And Ms. Brown would then become an advocate for myself and my family. And acknowledging that we did not have all the tools, we had to acknowledge that other people had to fight with us and for us. And sometimes that means that we have to still accept the responsibilities, which leads to my third point, accepting my responsibilities. But what is my responsibility when I'm innocent and I'm in prison? The irony is I'm innocent and I'm still under somebody else's authority. Here I am, an innocent man in prison, and the first job that I have for approximately three to four years is in the fields. I'm chopping grass with a garden hoe. I'm picking sweet potatoes. I'm pulling corn and shifting maize. All done after I've been awoken at 4 a.m. and given some French toast. The stark reality of slavery resonated so much with me because here I am in the fields and your average officer that's overlooking you as a white male on a horse and the average person that's working beside you as a minority, either black or Hispanic. And the only way that you can get out of the fields is you have to appeal to the boss and maybe you can work in the building. And so I was eventually moved out of the fields because of my work ethics and I got into the building and I started working in the kitchen, and moved on to the craft shop and ad seg, infirmary and visitation and so forth. My responsibility as a prisoner was still to humble myself under the authority. And as I say, it is, it's hard to even think of and it was hard to do. But my goal was my innocence. My goal was my freedom. And I could not let anybody take my innocence away. Not the system, or not the people in the system. This awakening pushed not only myself, but it pushed my family to move towards what we needed to do and accepting our responsibilities. After we accepted the responsibilities of being wrongfully incarcerated, there was a release. The irony of my release is it was first internal before it was external. While I was incarcerated over the years, I saw a change in myself. I had to rid myself of the anger, Resentment, fear, all of this only led me to one emotion, which was suicide. Being wrongfully incarcerated for almost 12 years now, I really thought that taking my life was the answer. Because who really cared? The system that we thought was true didn't really do anything for us. My mom and dad were constantly fighting and being with me, but nobody heard their cries. And sometimes death seems to be the best way out. But I had another choice, and that choice was to continue to fight. 13 years into my sentence, I and my family had done everything that we could do. I had filed my own writ of habeas corpus 1107. The direct appeal had gotten denied. I stayed out of Detroit when in prison. I wrote numerous letters to organizations, newspapers, and nothing seemed to break. And the obvious institutionalized mindset that I was falling into, I had to also be released from. But how could I be released from a prison inside of a prison? I had to understand and keep in my heart of heart that I was and still am an innocent man. It was 13 years after I had been incarcerated 
And I remember so distinctively working in the infirmary and one of the ladies would come and speak to me every morning as they came to work. And my response when she would say, good morning is, all right, all right. Very hard and very callous. I didn't think that my response was due to being institutionalized until she challenged me. And she said, Richard, we always say good morning to you. and Your response is always, all right, all right. Why do you never respond back, good morning? And it was in that instance that I remembered that you don't say good morning when you wake up and you see your cellie. It's just another day. And for 13 years, I woke up not saying good morning, but looking at my cellie and saying, you all right today? My cellie's response was, I'm all right. You all right? I'm all right. Sometimes that's all we settle for. It's just being all right. When this young lady challenged me, I talked to my mom later on that night. And my mom asked me, she said, Richard, when you look out your window, what do you see? I told my mom, I said, mom, I see the bars. I see the, the barbed wire. I see the fence. I see the guards, the towers, and my mom challenged me. She said, Richard, next time you look at your cell window, look up. Looking up didn't change my place of incarceration. Looking up didn't change my state of being innocent or in prison. Looking up changed my perception. It changed where I was looking while I was incarcerated. Two years after this release, this internal release of the pain that I endured of a wrongful incarceration and treatment of the prison system and the denial of so many rights, two years after this, the Innocence Organization Centurion that then told me to write 10 years prior, accepted my case. I was on lockdown, institutional lockdown, the whole unit. And I, the male person comes by and she gives, asks for my TDC number and I give them my TDC number and they push a box in the cell. And in the box is my transcripts. I read my transcripts and I'm taken back to my trial and memories flood me. And I'm understanding that my opportunity of freedom is now. The fight for civil rights is now. And all I had to do was continuously to push. I remember getting the police records and, 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 and reading through the police records. And, and, and the first document that I saw was a phone call that was made to the police officers months before I went to jury trial. A young lady who had been getting beat up by her boyfriend, who he had been bragging about killing one guy and shooting another person by Bachman Lake a year prior. She went into grave details about my case. This woman actually called and told them who did the shooting, gave them the names and who they was with. This was in the police records way before I went to jury trial. I knew then that this was Brady violation, a failure to disclose exculpatory evidence favorable to the defendant. This began to unlock the door for Centurion. I would walk out of prison in October of 2009 after multiple pieces of evidence was discovered in the police records that had they been presented during jury trial, I would not have been found guilty. Two and a half years after I was released, I was claimed or deemed actually innocent. That was a tedious process. Dallas was blessed to have his first black district attorney, which was district attorney Craig Watkins, who beyond all means pushed the needle for criminal justice reform by releasing those men and women that were actually innocent and pushing the needle to make sure that their lives was better once they was released. My case hit the Conviction Integrity Unit, which was led by Mike Ware, and through their continued investigation, they brought the evidence forth that the one witness that testified against me had been coerced by the prosecutor and he signed an affidavit claiming that he 
did not shoot, did, he did not identify me as the shooter because he saw me, but he identified me as the shooter because the prosecutor told him. With further investigation, they found out that the gunshot residue tests that had been conducted on my hands that night and where Swift testified in jury trial that the palm of my right hand was positive for gunpowder and negative anywhere else. This test was negative. The woman did not state true facts. And so this gun ballistics test, this GSR test was overturned. And so the two pieces of evidence that convicted me were both fabricated by the state. Those two pieces of evidence on top of all of the evidence that was not presented that was in my police files. And on top of everything that happened in my jury trial led to the Court of Criminal Appeals in February of 2012, yielding a unanimous decision of actual innocence for Richard Ray Miles Jr. Today, ex parte Richard Miles is in the law books for anybody that's been wrongfully incarcerated, where you do not have DNA, you can build your case of actual innocence on ex parte Richard Miles. This was a key left in prison that I did not think would have been possible because all the years while I was in prison, I studied and there was nothing that I could really find to defend myself or my innocence. In closing, I want to thank you first and foremost for being attentive, but not only being attentive, for creating a space of empathy. In today's time where we are, I think that every person on this call, and that's not even on this call, we've reached a place of vulnerability. Whether it's being vulnerable because we are in a position that we don't have the true answers for, or whether it's vulnerable because of illnesses. We've reached this point, but I encourage you that in the vulnerability of yourself, you will find strength in others. It was in my vulnerability that I found strength, not only in my family, but in other men that was wrongfully incarcerated that helped me through my journey. I want to thank you all for being attentive and listening and being a part of tonight's series, The Fight for Civil Rights in the South. Thank you. Richard, thank you so much for sharing your story. I've, I've heard it before, but I get chills every time still. Um, I'd now like to invite Gary and Sarah to join us to continue the conversation. Thank you. Thank you, Annie. Um, I agree. <laughs> I, I reiterate what Annie said, which is that I've heard your story before from you, Richard. Um, and I don't get chills. I get angry every time I hear it. Um, you know, and I, I find myself, because we muted, I find myself yelling at the, at, at my computer screen, but why? <laughs> and, and, you know, I, I, I understand that, that things happen. Um, so, um, let's get started. Uh, we'll, we'll have a discussion back and forth uh, with uh, you, Gary, and with you, Richard, and uh, we'll go until probably around eight if we can, and then what we'll do is we'll open to question and answer from, from the audience. And I've seen several of them come in already, and they're, they're, they're great questions. So, uh, Gary, what I would like to do is start with you. Uh, we've been given a little bit of background on, on Centurion or what used to be Centurion Ministries by, by Richard and the fact that they worked with non-DNA exonerations, but your uh, Innocence Project career has been with an organization that works on DNA exonerations. So could you tell us a little bit about the Innocence Project, how it works and what br brought you in? Well, so, so the Innocence Project, um, the National Innocence Project in, that's based in New York, New York is actually a different organization from the Innocence Project of Texas, uh, which is my organization. And there are Innocence Projects all over the country. Um, the Innocence Project in New York is the um, organization that Barry Sheck started. Jim McCloskey started Centurion Ministry. 
degrees in New Jersey. Those were the two national organizations that really started this movement. And Jim McCloskey was doing non-DNA cases and Barry Sheck started doing DNA cases. The Innocence Project of Texas began in 2006 and we do all kinds of cases. We, we have never limited ourselves to DNA cases. Uh, we have had a, a, a fair number of DNA exonerations, but we've also had a substantial number of exonerations that were not DNA. And so we work on all kinds of, in fact, now, at least in Texas, DNA exonerations are becoming rare because DNA has, DNA testing has been available now for about the last 15 years in Texas is for people that are in print. So most of our work currently is on non-DNA cases. Okay. What drew you to the Innocence Project? Well, so I, I've been a criminal defense lawyer since 1980. And I have always in my practice handled innocence cases. But when the Innocence Project of Texas was being formed in 2006, and I was given an opportunity to be part of it. It was a chance for me to take the skills I developed in all those years of law practice and to use them in a more systematic way to handle these kinds of cases on a regular basis. And it was a, a real opportunity for me because this is what I always thought I was doing a law degree. This is why I went the law school was to do something like this kind of work. And as a criminal defense lawyer, you have an opportunity to do it, but it's sort of hit and miss. It's not a regular basis. So for about the last 12 years, I have had the opportunity to devote about half my time to working on cases like Richard's case and to meeting people like Richard and, and to working with the exonerees and to working on their cases and being part of something that's bigger than just an individual person. Like Richard is an extraordinary person. He has an extraordinary story. He is part of a whole movement of people around the country. And that's what's on me to work in the Innocence Project of Texas is an opportunity to be a part of that. Okay. Richard, would you tell us how you and Gary first connected? So it's a good question. And I, I actually had to <laughs> call Gary because I've been working with him so long. But we actually met in the district attorney's office under Craig Watkins' tenure. Um, I was up there with Mike Ware um, for something. And Mike Ware actually introduced Gary and myself. Um, and since then, we've worked on different projects at Kale and, and different other speaking events and so forth. Okay. Gary, this question is for you. Uh, you've talked about being a trial attorney, being an appellate attorney. In your time doing this kind of work, have you seen a lot of cases like Richard's, a few cases like Richard's? That, that's kind of part one of the question. And part two of the question, which, which gets back to, to Richard's story, is do you see that the majority of these cases that you do come across involve minorities who have been wrongly convicted? Is it a mix? You're, can you give us a sense of kind of the overview of what you've seen? Well, so the Innocence Project of Texas, uh, my organization, we have about 20 exonerations, um, and every one of them is different. Uh, Richard's story is unique, but uh, every story is unique, but I see people and know people and meet people that are in the exact same position Richard is in all the time. There are, uh, and nobody knows how many innocent people there are in Texas prisons. There's about 150,000 uh, inmates in the Texas system. There are thousands and thousands of inmates that are innocent. Uh, uh, most of whom are still there because there's either not the resources to take their cases or there's not the opportunity to, to put evidence together to prove their innocence. There are people I deal with on a daily basis that are in the exact same situation Richard is in. To your second question, uh, the vast majority of exonerations, not only in Texas, 
but across the country, are black men. Um, it is a sign of the one of the many problems in the criminal justice system that there is without uh, racial prejudice in the system. And we see it every day in the people that are going to prison. And we also see it in the people that are getting exonerated. Okay. So this question uh, is for Richard. And it gets to some of the questions that, uh, that people have, are already asking the Q&A. So there's gonna be a little bit of overlap. Richard, you filed a grievance uh, against the prosecutor in your original trial. Mm -hmm. And you filed it with, the, with the, the Texas State Bar. Can you talk a little bit about that process and the results of that process? Because this was a big deal. Yes, yes ma'am. So shortly after I was fully exonerated in February of 2012, I sat with my um, appellate attorney, which was Cheryl Watley, and I wanted to move forward with um, filing on the prosecutor. So the prosecutor in my case is public record. records. His name was Thomas Dillmore. Uh, I filed with the Texas Bar, and the files, I didn't actually file, we paid an attorney. So we paid an attorney to do the filing for us. And the state board returned or came back with the ruling that there were errors of prosecutorial misconduct that they did find in my case. Mr. Dia Moore got an attorney. Um, we were actually supposed to move forward and I never heard anything else about it. Uh, so I'm thinking that the whole case was dropped. Um, I believe the, the, the Texas bar said that it was nothing else needed to be done on it. Um, but this was in 2012. Okay. All right. And, and we'll come back to this in, in a few moments. Yes. Gary, what do you see as the shortcomings of our current criminal justice system? And how does wrongful conviction happen? And what, if anything, can be done about it? And in fact, I want to ask this question of both of you, because I think that you've, you, you both see and have experienced very different sides of this criminal justice system. So, so Gary, can you answer the shortcomings of the criminal justice system from your perspective? And then, Richard, would you answer from your perspective? Because I suspect they're going to be different. And I, I would like to refer to Richard's case in, in answering that question because Richard and I appear a lot together and I speak to a lot of the groups of lawyers and I always talk to the lawyers about Richard's case because Richard's case is one of the most important cases to help to develop the law in Texas about wrongful convictions and directions. And one of the reasons is, is because it exemplifies so many of the problems in the criminal justice system. Like, for instance, there was bad eyewitness identification in Richard's case. The police led an eyewitness to identify Richard when Richard was not the person who did this. You see bad eyewitness identification in, in actually most of the DNA exonerations around the country and in a fair number of the non-DNA exonerations. You had police tunnel vision and prosecutors with tunnel vision. The police were actually receiving calls from people telling them who did this murder. But they had already accused Richard of this murder, and they were just ignoring the calls they received because of their tunnel vision of being focused on Richard. You had suppression of exculpatory evidence. You had evidence that was, that was known to the state that, that was not told to the defense lawyer as the law required. And then you had bad scientific evidence. And these are things that we see over and over again. And these are among the problems in the criminal justice system that we're dealing with every day, trying to, de to, to correct to make sure these sort of things don't happen. Richard, could you also speak to your view of the, the shortcomings of our uh, current criminal justice system? Yes, ma'am. And so, so much to, to piggyback on what Mr. Yudishan was saying. Um, I think that the reality in my case is we have to also acknowledge that we as people are imperfect. 
Um, and for whatever reason, we, we, we harbor imperfections. I should have never been arrested because I did not physically fit the description. And so an officer arrests the person that's not physically fitting the description and the detective sees the same thing. Nobody ever questions my physical description being totally different and they disregard that. Outside of that, when we move towards the courtroom, this is, the courtroom is really, to me, it is where justice is supposed to flow as a symphony. And the judge is supposed to be the orchestrator of justice. So it harmoniously connects together. And our jurors are those individuals that listen to the harmony of justice to make sure that it seems well. In my case, the judge was not a good orchestrator of justice because so much evidence was blatantly in front of the judge that was disregarded. But I oftentimes say in my speaking engagements that I cannot only point out the police officers, the, the detectives, because I had a trial by jury. And our jurors are held by reasonable doubt if you think this person is innocent, you have to plead not guilty. But because I was arrested and our system embraces authority more than they are willing to embrace the imperfections in authority, I lost my freedom. Okay, that's, that's, a, that's a very good way to, to put that as well, I think. So Richard, you, you clearly, um, did a, an incredible amount of self-educating uh, while you were in, in, in prison. I mean, I'm listening to you and I'm going, is he a lawyer? Is he not a lawyer? I mean, <laughs> what you were talking about, exculpatory evidence. I'm like, okay. <laughs> um, and as a historian, you know, to, when you start your talk and, and you talk about not being the first incarcerated black man because you go back to 1863 and so you took us through a history of, of the Texas prison system. I, that impresses the daylights out of me, just, just the kind of the breadth of what you're doing. Could you talk more about how you went about giving yourself this, this incredibly useful and purposeful education while you were in prison? And as part of that, what drove you? I mean, because I'm imagining that there were days where you just went back to your cell and said, oh, I can't get through this. I mean, right. you talked about suicidal thoughts. So, so what, the flip side of this is what continued to help you put one foot after the other? Right, right. So some, some great, great questions. And so the, the understanding of the Texas prison system, um, this brought my curiosity on because the Texas prison was my captor. And in order for me to overcome my captor, I had to understand the system in itself. You know, it's like when somebody gets captured, you understand, you look for escape routes. I wasn't gonna physically escape, because that was impossible. But if I could learn the system, the originality of, of the system, the origin of the system, then mentally I could deal with the system. And so my studies began to embark on the Texas prison system itself and understanding that makeup. Now for my innocence, Meeting Benjamin Spencer was a life changer and a game changer for me because this man right here, he, he's one of the first men that I met in prison and he cut her in a barbershop and he's innocent. And he gives me the address to Centurion Ministries. That was the name at that time. But fast forward two years later, Ben tells me after my direct appeal is denied, he said, Richard, you are now your own lawyer. I said, I said what do you mean? He said, the state isn't going to give you an attorney. The state gave you a trial attorney, court appointed. The state gave you an appellate attorney. He said, Richard, if you're innocent, you are now your attorney. And so here I am, 23 years old, sitting in a law library with outdated books. And I'm frustrated to try to figure out what do I do. And in comes a guy named Ricky White. Ricky Wyatt is innocent. He's been released. He spent over 30 years in prison. Ricky sat down with me amongst other men that were all innocent. Johnny Pinchback, Christopher Scott, Andre Garage. We were all in the law library at one point in time fighting for our innocence. 
and that showed me this thing was way bigger than me. And it was in our weakness that we found strength together. And on this side of the playing field, most of the men have made it out. Some are still in. But those, that's where I found my strength inside of prison. You know, outside of my family and my faith, it was the men that was in there, and that's still there. So it's the three Fs, family, faith, family, friends. family, yes, yes, yes. Yeah, that's, that's, that's good to hear. So Richard, can you talk about um, your organization, Miles of Freedom, and yes. specifically, what does it mean to you to run a nonprofit that helps people who were affected by not necessarily the same conditions that you were, but who were incarcerated, who, who yes. themselves were, were sucked into the system. Yes, yes. So Miles of Freedom was started in 2012 after my full exoneration. Um, I was released in 2009, and one of the things the Dallas exonerees did in that time frame, we had to advocate to the state for compensation. There was really no compensation given to us. Uh, eventually, the state allotted the compensation, and when I was exonerated, I'm financially compensated, and this gave me the mobility to do whatever I felt like my heart's desires was. However, this compensation came from a dark place. Hmm. Six months before I walked out of prison, my dad died. My dad made sure that my mom came to visit me every month. My dad died as a bishop. His name is Bishop William L. Moore. My dad died a counselor. And when the state exonerated me, nobody ever apologized to me. It just exonerated me. Mm. Oh, we got the wrong person. And so to start an organization that assists individuals, families, and communities that's impacted by incarceration, regardless if you're innocent or guilty, miles of freedom gives purpose to my pain. Because no amount of money can bring my dad back or give me the 15 years that I lost in prison. Mm -hmm. But if I can keep somebody from going back to prison, if I can take a family to prison to make sure that they see their loved ones whenever they want to see them, if I can do that, then that's my forgiveness from the state because I'm put in a position to work with the state. And so that's why Miles of Freedom is so important to me and I am blessed just to be a part of this organization and this movement. Mm -hmm. Okay. Gary, can you talk a, a little bit about the, I guess, the costs of the, of the whole process? Because we never talk, we, we know, you know, you have, you have a right to a court-appointed attorney. Clearly, when the, the door slams shut behind you, that's the end of that. You become your own attorney, Richard. But Gary, you're then, you and, and your organization stepped in. What are the costs? And I'm assuming that it's not just financial costs. There must be, there must be physical tolls. There must be other things on your side of this equation as well. Could you share some of that with us? I'm happy to. So, so the, our, our organization, like all of the Innocence organizations, we rely upon donor money to, to finance our organization. And there's none. There is just never enough money. We, we have three lawyers working for our organization now, they're staff attorneys. We need 10 lawyers. A lot of our work is done by lawyers like me who volunteer our time to handle these cases. And it's an opportunity for me to do this. I view it as, a, as something that I've been given this opportunity to work on these cases. And I do it every minute that I can, but there's not enough minutes in the day, and not enough lawyers to do this. So it's very difficult to get these cases done. They take a long time. They take a lot of resources. And all I can say is not just our organization, but for everybody doing this work, we need people's help to get this work done. Okay. Okay. Gentlemen, thank you very much for, for this uh, section of the uh, evening. And what I'd like to do now is to move to asking you both questions from, from our uh, audience. Uh, I'd like to start with a question from Kayla Gilman. 
And she uh, asked the question of Richard. She says, thank you so much for your time and story today. I am wondering if you could speak to your experience with prison education programming while you were inside. And if you have any advice for educators like me who work inside prisons and jails. Yes, so um, on Cofield unit, so each each unit is different. Um, uh, Windham um, is kind of like the basic educational system within the Texas Department of Correction. It's like DISD, Windham School District, okay? Um, when I was on Cofield unit, I eventually got enrolled in Trinity Valley Community College. Uh, this was, oh my God, this was probably about 98, 99. Um, and I went all through college. I actually achieved my associate's degree in applied science. But shortly after that, probably about 2002, the budget cut hit. And basically what the budget cut did with the prison system and with collegiate education was if you did not have the money on your books, you couldn't go to school. And so with no FAPS for grant, nobody had 32, 62, whatever thousand of dollars that you needed on your books to go up the ladder. And so over the years, the educational system within TDC has not been as robust as it used to be. Mm -hmm. um, you do have some vocational uh, classes. Um, so on Copia Unit, you had automotive. The training is not up to date. So when you get a certificate in prison, it's really not useful or parallel to the skill sets out here. One of my first college classes I took was AutoCAD, release uh, AutoCAD drafting. So this deals with architecture, drawings. Well, release 12 was so outdated that it would not help me even back then. And so I think that our system um, in all of its willingness to want to put education in the system, they're not really doing a good job mm -hmm. at making sure that the education is accessible and equitable to when people are released from prison. Um, and so that's been my experience of the educational system within the prison system. Um, for those individuals that are working in the systems, I, I would say when you go to work, remember that you are working with a person that either committed a crime or that is accused of a crime. Not you are working with the criminal. It's two totally different things. Because if you put the crime before the person, you never connect to your mission. And that's the problem that we face today. We always put the crime or the person's negative things before the individual. And we can't get through the crime to connect to the person. And so for the teachers and the systems, I always understand Hey man, everybody has done something, but I'm working with this person and I'm not looking at them as a criminal. And if you stick to that, you will be able to save the ones that you are there to save. Okay. It reminds me of the old Catholic adage and, and mind you, I'm a Jew giving a Catholic adage. So, <laughs> so take it for what it's worth. Um, but that, that hate the sin, but not the sinner. Um, yes. and, I, and I really think that people need to keep that in mind. I think you're absolutely right. Yes. Okay. Uh, Sharon Buckley would like to know what was the makeup of your jury, Richard? And I, I'm assuming that she's asking what was the racial makeup? And yes. that leads us to a second question. So if you could answer that first, please. So very diverse jury. I had a very diverse jury. I, I even think my jury form was a young black, uh, black young black female. Um, uh, um, I want to say it was very diverse. I cannot say it was, you know, it was diverse. Yes. So, I, I guess what I'm hearing from you is that on some level, it's not systemic racism that was responsible. For, for getting you in there on the first in the first place? Is that what you're saying? Or is it so kind of baked into the system that even people who are African-American on the jury 
look at fellow African Americans differently. I guess I'm I'm, I'm asking yeah. you for a judgment call. Yes. So so my understand that you have systemic racism and implicit bias. You have all of these things baked into our criminal legal system. And I say criminal legal system because it's not just. And until we start doing those things that make our system just, I can only refer to it as a legal process to incarcerate people. Now, when we look at that, I have to consider that I should have never been arrested. So was I arrested because of systemic racism or implicit bias? We don't know. When going through via door, which is the time frame that you're picking the jurors, the average person that's sitting in this room waiting to be picked or waiting to tell the jury, tell the person that I'm sick tomorrow and I can't uh, work on jury duty, the average person has already convicted the person that's sitting beside the lawyer. So you're guilty until proven innocent. Is that systemic racism or implicit bias? <clears throat> I think to your point, everything is so interwoven together. We have to check our own selves at the door to make sure that we're not moving with any biases or implicit thinking or cognitive disorders or, or mental blocks or anything like that when we're dealing with people's lives. I, I think that that's, I, just the, the way you, and, and the museum specifically has a, a beyond tolerance theater in which we deal with the whole concept of of uh, uh, implicit bias, and we, we offer workshops on this, workshops as does Kayla, by the way, uh, in, uh, as well. Uh, I think that's a very good point. So uh, I, this, this question, I, I think, is more uh, for you, uh, Gary. Um, how do we start the process to change laws to hold accountable the people in the legal system, and, and this would be prosecutors, DAs, judges, you know, the, the, the whole, the whole uh, panoply of people that abuse their positions to convict innocent uh, people. And this is Becky Wilson who asked this question. Well, that's a, that's a good question. And I will say that things are better now than they used to be. There is just no question about that. And a lot of that is because uh, people like Richard and people hearing Richard's story, part of what the Innocence Project of Texas does is every two years when the legislature is in session, we have an entire uh, agenda of items that we propose at the legislature uh, to try to improve the system and address some of the things we're talking about here. And Richard and a whole group of exonerees always come down to Austin with us and we walk the halls of the legislature, of the of the Capitol and we talk to people and they talk to people and we testify at committees and people like Richard testify and people listen to Richard and people listen to exonerees and Texas has led the nation in some of the laws we've passed to hope to help change the system and to help hold people accountable for some of the things they they've done. We also in Texas have led the country in, in DA's offices forming conviction integrity units. And Richard referred to that earlier about as, as one of the reasons why his, he went out of prison was the Dallas County District Attorney's Office forming what was the first conviction integrity unit in any district attorney's office in the country. They're all over the country now, and it started here at Dallas, and their job is to uh, find cases where people were not properly convicted to assist in getting them out and to hold people accountable, prosecutors, police officers who did something wrong in the Dallas office and conviction integrity unit offices and DA's offices around the country have done a lot of work in that regard. Okay. Richard, to follow on this, would you talk about, please, what happened to those who were responsible for your wrongful incarceration? And, and in essence, in many ways, really doubling down because they blocked exculpatory evidence from, from coming, being brought to your trial. So what happened to them? So, so the question about the actual, the actual people that did the crime? Yeah. yeah so, so when the the conviction integrity unit at that point in time they actually went and talked to 
um, as well as Centurion. They went and talked to the people um, that was on this phone call or in this phone call memo. Um, the three people all gave statements that put them at the shooting the night that this thing happened. However, no one would come to testify 15 years later to the evidence that was never presented in trial 15 years prior. And so the only thing that the Innocence Organization had and the Conviction Integrity Unit really had was exculpatory evidence that was never turned over. And so the people, while they know who did it, they themselves, the Dallas Police Department and whoever, didn't really pursue mm -hmm. the closing of this case. And probably because they really feel, they realized that they had the wrong person. If we release him, then these other people will do something else or whatever. I don't know. And the only thing that I do know is they talked to each one of the people in the document and they did um, receive some very uh, interesting information that would give reason to believe that they were the actual shooters. What happened to the prosecutor who, who held back the exculpatory information. Nothing. That was the prosecutor that I filed on. Okay. So, he, so that's it. He. Now, he's now he's now a defense lawyer, I believe. So that last I checked, this was a couple of years ago. Um, he's now a defense attorney. Uh, and actually, when when District Attorney Craig Watkins first got in the office, this was one of the first prosecutors that he was let that that was let go. And ironically, this prosecutor has another exoneration under his belt, which is Andre Carrage. And so that's the reason that I really filed, not just for my case, I saw multiple exonerations that was up under this one prosecutor's belt. And I was like, nah, I, I can't let this slide like that. So. Okay. Michelle Hairston asks a, a really important question. She makes a statement too, which I think is important. She says, we need more innocence projects and work around eliminating systemic racism as well. And she asked the question of both of you, how can the community help to bring more awareness and support to this type of work, really to help correct this problem and to move us forward? Because the problem, you know, even though as, as Gary, as you say, in, in Texas, we've made, judging by where we started, we've made remarkable strides, but clearly there's still work to be done. So, so could you each give give our audience a sense of what that work is that you think needs still to be done? Um, let's start with you, Gary, because because Richard has been talking, and then we'll flip to you, Richard. Okay. Okay. Well, let me let me just kind of give a shout out to John Cruzo, who's the Dallas County District Attorney on this, because he's working on this very issue. What what he's working on is over incarceration. There are too many people in prison too many black and people in prison and he is working on policies within his office and policies around the state to, to lower the number of people that are in prison to shorten sentences of people that are in prison and he's working on bail reform to not keep people locked up that don't be locked up pending trial and all of those issues are tied in with racial problems in our society. And I think the best place to work on those is when you have a good, strong district attorney like we have in Dallas County who's sitting on this. And it's being focused on by progressive district attorneys around the country. And I, I, I have some optimism that in Dallas County and in other parts of the state, we're going to make some, some real progress on that because the people that are in a position of power to do something on the issues. Okay. Richard? So, so I, 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 I think um, what, what I will, what I'll give is kind of like, I'll just re-highlight the points that I, that I brought up in regards to what can we do right now as, as just ordinary people and everyday people. The first thing is we have to awake we have to understand what we're dealing with. We have innocent people in prison. So, sometimes we don't want to, as a society, embrace the indiscretions of our system 
it's almost like being in a domestic violence relationship where the security of being in a relationship is better than acknowledging the imperfections of the relationship, just to be in one. Mm -hmm. And so society, just to feel the authority or the sense of authority with the criminal justice system, we excuse the indiscretions. We need to awake from that mindset and that mentality. The second thing is to acknowledge our position. We have people that are in position. What hurts me the most is there have been no exonerations. Since District Attorney Craig Watkins really kicked in, it's been a few, but there has not been any exonerations. And there's multiple reasons for that. And the people that are in position, if they do not acknowledge we have innocent people in prison, then they are, they are not acknowledging the basic aspects of humanity that we are not supposed to hold innocent people in prison. It doesn't matter if we're gonna have to compensate them when they get out. If you have somebody in prison that's innocent, you need to let them go. So we need to acknowledge our positions and our capacity and our authority in those positions. The next thing is accept our responsibilities. If you are in a position then there is a responsibility and a due diligence that's afforded to you. And if you're not in position, then share the truth. Share the truth. When you hear something, you're on Facebook all day. If you read something, they say, say something. If you see something, share it. If it's the truth, share it. Don't get caught up in the status quo because you don't want to be by yourself. And the last thing is just to push for the release. When I got the letter from Centurion in 1997, it was 10 years before I was exonerated. Mm -hmm. And sometimes we don't get out. Benjamin Spencer still sits in prison, but we got to constantly push for that release. That's what we need to do. It's easy, it's simple, but sometimes those are the things that we don't want to do. Right. Okay. Laura Hewn actually asks, why do you think that Benjamin Spencer still sits in prison? Um, do you have a, a, a sense of what's preventing him from getting out or? Um, you, you know, it, when it, it goes back to our system. So Benjamin Spencer case, when you look at, when you, when you research it, the, the lower courts ruled him actually innocent. Now, interestingly, Texas is one of the only states where the lower court judge isn't the final say so. It has to go to the CCA or the Court of Criminal Appeals. So the lower court says, man, you know what? We tripped out. We, we, we sent an innocent man to prison. We're sorry. Oh, we got to do something. Oh, no, you got to send it up to the CCA. And if the Court of Criminal Appeals does not agree with the lower courts, now you have this battle going on. Why is Benjamin Spencer still innocent and in prison? I don't know. But I know if you read his case, you will see that there are areas of innocence. There are areas of things that at least cause reasonable doubt. And this man still sits in prison, innocent. And not even that, we have people that's been released and they haven't really been proven actually innocent, but they're innocent. At the end of the day, I really feel like that a lot of, the thing, a lot of things boil down to money and pride. Because Texas passed the legislation that innocent people are compensated, we don't want to pay anybody any money, and we are too prideful to say that we're sorry. So we have innocent people in prison, and we keep the money for ourselves. Okay. I have one further question uh, for you, Richard, and then I'm going to turn this back over to Annie. So before I ask you this question, I just wanted to thank both you and Gary for the work that you do, for your willingness to, to, to speak publicly about this, for you, Richard, to rehash what was, what was incredibly painful for you again and again and again to educate other people. And I guess more than anything else, I, I wanna thank both of you for bringing the human being to the center of this story, that this isn't systems and prisons and police departments, that there is a human being who's caught in the center of this mesh and you center that and that's what you give that that person a face and that's very important so before i turn it back over to annie i want to share uh uh miriam gaetan's question with you and i think it's a wonderful question 
uh, for us to go out on. And she wants to know what was it like to sit, eat, and hug your mother once you were free? And that must have really been something. Yes, yes, it was. It was. Um, it was surreal because keep in mind, six months prior, my dad had just died. Mm -hmm. um, and the, the scriptures tells us unless a grain of wheat falls to the ground and die, new life cannot come forth. And it's not to say that my dad had to die in order for the gates to open up, but the reality is that that happened. I remember when my dad was in the hospital fighting for cancer, Jim McCluskey came to see him in June and he told him, man, we have everything to prove your son rich and innocent. And it was at that moment that my dad closed his eyes and he took his last breath. When I walked out of prison six months later, my mom was totally lost, but she was happy to have her son back. And for 15 years, all I wanted to do was hug my mom and my dad. But for that moment, I was just happy to hug my mom, to stand with her and to let her know that I was out, that my faith held on, my family held on, and my freedom brought me back home. I feel like I should say amen after a statement <laughs> like that. <laughs> um, I'll and say amen. <laughs> Yeah, amen from here too. Um, well, I'll echo Sarah's thanks. Thank you so much, Richard and Gary. I wanted to mention, we've had a couple of folks ask if they can, uh, if there's a way to share this with other people who have missed it. Uh, thank you to Richard and Gary. They've generously allowed us to record this session. So it will be on the museum's YouTube channel in just a few days. If you go to YouTube and search DHHRM. Um, we also had a couple questions we couldn't get to, more questions about Miles of Freedom. They have a great website. You can visit milesoffreedom.org. I'll give a plug for that. Thank you one more time to our sponsor, IMA Financial Group. Um, and thank you again to our speakers. We're, we're so grateful for you to spend this time with us tonight. Um, I hope everyone stays healthy and well, and we look forward to seeing you next time. Good night. Thank you.